Welcome to a Date with Darkness podcast, where I will be discussing the impact of hurtful and abusive relationships and how to overcome them so that you can move through your pain and get to the kind of healthy relationships you want, need, and deserve. I'm Dr. Natalie Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist based in California. While I hope that you find this podcast educational and informational, please note it should not be substituted for treatment with a licensed mental health professional. Also, due to the nature of the podcast, some of the information presented on the show can be sensitive to some of my listeners. So please note that listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome back. It's been a while since I've done a solo cast and I definitely wanted to put together something for you guys um, because I miss doing them and I love uh, kind of doing a solo cast uh, because, you know, with the interviews, they're great and they're informative and I learned so much from the guests, but, you know, it, there's an unpredictability to it. You know, you never know how that's going to go. Um, whereas with this one, this is more something that I kind of informally put together and plan about what to talk to you guys about. Um, so I love doing solo casts for that reason and connecting with you, the listener one-on-one. -on -one. And I hope that you guys are doing okay. And of course, I like to get through the housekeeping the individual and group coaching membership is scheduled to launch very, very soon. So if you want to be in the know and be on the list for that, um, please sign up in the description box. So the link is um, below in the show notes there, uh, depending on what platform that you, you use, whether it be iTunes, YouTube, or what have you, it's going to be definitely in the show notes. And you don't want to miss that. Um, so it's going to be very personalized and it's, uh, you know, the group membership and the individual coaching membership is designed to help you heal and overcome and have a life that is thriving and designed to help you form relationships that are going to pour into you um, and so that you feel loved and you feel healed. So definitely want to, you know, let you guys know about that. And I think it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. Um, and um, it's something that I've, I've been very thoughtful about crafting um, to help you with your unique experiences of narcissistic abuse um, and, and healing and recovering from that. And of course, if you want to um, join the the Facebook group currently online. It's a date with darkness, Facebook group. That link is also below in the show notes, as well as if you want to be on my email news list, uh, newsletter list. Um, I send that out typically every Friday morning and it's all things about healing, recovering and understanding uh, narcissistic abuse. And so, okay. So with all that said, I'd like to jump into today's topic. And today's topic, of course, you know, I have my handy dandy uh, notebook here, but, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about when people, what people tend to underestimate or minimize, or they don't think about when it comes to dealing with or being in a relationship with a narcissist. Um, and, you know, just in counseling people over the years, just in my own experience, also in my own training too, and working with people with some very severe psychopathy, sociopathy, and personality disorder, um, you know, in, in the criminal justice system, I've come across a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of forms of manipulation and people, um, people just don't under, people underestimate, or they don't understand, um, how manipulation works. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about, you know, just some of the things that I've noticed and some of the things that I want you to consider um, when you're dealing with, you know, if, if it's not a narcissist or, you know, maybe it could be someone with narcissistic traits, it could be someone who is extremely manipulative um, and again, a psychopath or a sociopath. 
those those types of individuals are not going to stand out. They're not going to have horns on their heads. They're going to blend into the crowd and they're going to look normal. They may even look good looking. Um, so they're going to be, you know, physically when you looked at them, you're not going to be able to tell, but, you know, over time you may be able to tell um, other people might warn you, um, you know, just any number of things could happen, but here are some quick and dirty things um, that, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to share with you. Number one is manipulation tends to start small. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, typically when people realize that they've been bamboozled or taken advantage of, it's usually um, some large telltale signs, right? Like your bank account is low. Someone stole something from you. Um, you're, you're, you know, something has happened where you recognize finally that you've been taken advantage of. And it's usually like a big ta-da that finally is like your wake up call. Like, Hey, I've been hoodwinked or whatever you want to call it. But manipulation really and truthfully, it starts small. A, tr a person that has crafted their gift of manipulation is first, is they're going to start with a small thing um, that they know is against the rules, or they know that sort of violates norms, or they're asking, they're putting it in such a way to ask you to do a favor, right? So it's like, okay, I'm going to put this small thing out there and I'm going to see if they let me get away with that. Typically that's how it starts. I won't say that that's always the case, but for you know about 95% of the time, you usually start small and then it's a build upon that. Um, so for example, um, when I used to work in a prison system, you know, typically what uh, you know, a prison inmate will do is they will ask for something. They'll ask you for something small just to see if you will give it to them. Right. So um, you're not supposed to, you know, as staff members, you're not supposed to give inmates anything personal. They're supposed to go. There's like a chain of command and every inmate who's incarcerated, they know this, they know that you're supposed to go to an officer um, or that an exchange of anything is supposed to happen with an officer present. But you know, when you're, you know, when you're, when you're doing counseling or you're working with inmates in counseling sessions or groups, or, you know, even in the medical setting, they will start out by asking you something small, that something small could be like, Hey, can I have a pencil? I, I really just don't have any, any means of writing home. And I really miss my mom. Can I have a pencil? you know, or something, you know, something that seems to be small or minute, um, just to see if, first of all, if they can, you know, how you feel, how do you react with them asking you for something and can they get away with something that they know is against the rule? And so, you know, they really want to try you and see, um, hey, is this, is this person cool with it? Are they cool with me? How is this, how is this going to react? And so if you say yes, then they're going to come back with something else. Oh, can I, you know, can I get some writing paper? I appreciate you giving me a pencil, but you know, I need writing paper and I need these things. And pretty soon that starts to build, right? And the same thing happens, although I'm using, you know, prison as an example, you know, another, you know, in a relationship, it will also be another example, like, hey, can you, can you spot me $5? Can you, can you do this one favor for me, right? And the psychology behind that is people will more likely do things for you when you put it in the context that it's a favor or that you're helping them out. But this is also, um, a manipulation tactic that they use and that once they have this sort of uh, what I like to call the foot in the door then that door they they slowly start to barge in by escalating in the in the amount or what they're asking for until pretty soon um, they start to feel like they are owed these things at, at a certain point they will stop asking or they you know they feel like they know what they can get away with now and that they know that once we get to a 
certain point and, and they're in too deep with you that you're not going to ask questions or you're not going to push back and provide resistance. And it's because they've been studying your reaction to things this whole time. Number two, um, having a rational discussion um, when it's important to understand that typically a narcissist will want to have a discussion with you, you know, out of anger, or they'll, they'll want to gaslight you and sort of have these kind of conversations. And what I mean when I say it's important to understand that is that they want to have conversations with you, but it's on their terms. Um, so when something is on someone else's terms, they want to dictate that conversation, right? They want to, they want to project, they want to tell you how you feel, they want to deny, they want to say, well, you did this to me and sort of switch it around. They may want to triangulate and bring someone else in the conversation, you know, and you know, a lot of times what tends to happen, if you pay close enough attention, you and the narcissist are not talking about the same thing. They'll try to do this sort of circular dance or they'll change the topic altogether or they'll switch it around on you. Um, and it's important to note that when you're having a thoughtful, rational, logical conversation, very much like what I'm having with you now, that's very well planned and thought out. Um, and part of which, you know, I, you know, in which a person takes ownership for their responsibility or they're naming their feelings, you know, or they're saying that this action caused this action and that impacted me this way. Those are logical conversations. Chances are um, when you have a narcissist, especially if they're angry or they're acting in a fit of rage, they are not acting rationally. And when you are a rational person, you cannot have a thoughtful um productive, problem-solving, rational conversation with someone who is irrational. It doesn't matter if that person's lips are moving and they're having this conversation with you. There's a high likelihood that although they may have engaged in this conversation, chances are they're not going to follow through with anything that they talked about um, or they're going to quickly, they may lash out or something's going to happen as a result of their reaction to the conversation. Um, and that it's going to show that their behavior is in fact irrational. So that's something to keep in mind. You, you know, if you can't have a rational conversation with someone, how can you problem solve? How can you talk about issues that come up in the relationship? How can you both grow from things um, that are occurring, right? As opposed to things becoming obstructive, destructive, and spiraling out of control. And if you are in a relationship with an irrational person, that's exactly what's going to happen is things are going to quickly spiral. Number three, um, physical abuse or um, dangerousness of a person. So there are some people that have relationships with narcissists out there, and maybe they decide that uh, you you decide that you want to part ways, right? And one of the things to keep in mind is like, okay, well this this relationship a lot. This is a this is a lot of the thinking that I heard, or even that you know maybe at one point in time I may have had it with myself, but um, is that you know the the when someone breaks up with a narcissist, they're thinking maybe that, Hey, um, I'm not, I'm not concerned for my safety. I know this person, I know what they're capable of. So I'm not concerned that this person would ever harm me physically or lash out again, going back to the conversation that I had about rational versus irrational. There's a couple of things that you should keep in mind is one, if a person is irrational, their behavior is unpredictable. People are unpredictable in general. I mean, you may feel like you know someone, you may feel like you're very intimate with someone and you know what they're thinking and maybe you can finish their sentences. But when there's a breakup or when something happens or when you find out this person has been deceptive or harmful to you in any way, physical, um, physical abuse or physical threats 
that should never be off the table. Um, and you know, you don't want to turn your back on someone or minimize the fact that they could spiral out of control um, and, and react against you this way. And I, in going back to understanding the key element is control when a narcissist loses control, especially, you know, when it's, it's not their own doing, they want to do anything to get that back. And so there can be a number of, of means employed to try to get that control back. That could be uh, physical aggressiveness. That could be stalking. That could be, you know, sort of monitoring um, social media and things like that. That could be showing up. That could be projecting onto you things that they're doing. They're going to try to write this ship. And so as a result of that, um, please don't ever underestimate or dismiss or deny that just because you've never seen a person violent or react to, um, react to you physically, that does not need to be a means, uh, or that does not need to be your rationale for thinking that they would never escalate to do that. The fact still remains that a person harmed you in one way, and if they're capable of harming you in one or multiple ways, um, anything's possible. So just never, uh, just be sure to never dismiss or minimize that. Um, and always, um, always be thinking of that when you have decided to part ways with a person that has been dangerous, uh, whether they've been dangerous emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, um, you know, whatever the case may be, that's something to always uh, keep in mind. Fourth is the idea that you can be friends with a narcissist or that, you know, that they will always love you somehow. First of all, the whole notion of wanting to stay friends with an ex, nah, you know, it's kind of, it's one of those things for me that's like, you know, when people say that, especially right after they've gotten out of a relationship, it's almost like you want to keep the door open because you want to entertain the possibility that a person, you and that person could be lovers again, right? But especially with a narcissist, um, and if you know anything about narcissistic supply, uh, you know, a narcissist always wants to keep that foot in the door, right? And so that means that that person may always want to come back when they see fit or, um, you know, have you as a potential source. Uh, but more importantly, when you start to evaluate um, that person or your relationship with that person, take a look, a good, cold, hard look at that person. Are they actually capable of mutual, reciprocal, healthy friendships? Do they surround themselves with people that they can manipulate or people that don't really know them or superficial friendships? Um, do they use that word loosely or do they say that they don't need friends? So if that's the case, then there's probably not a good likelihood that they're going to be able to have a healthy friendship with you or that the friendship um, that they form with you is going to be one that has ulterior motives behind it. Um, the same is also true for love, um, which is, you know, friendship on fire is what I like to call love. Uh, but, uh, you know, if a person doesn't um, have the capacity for love or anytime they've talked about their past relationship, they don't ever, past relationships, they don't ever mention um, that they were in love or they talk poorly about people that they've been in a past relationship with in terms of degrading them, name calling and things like that, or projection, um, like it was all this person, um, they did this to me and they don't really speak in a way that sort of um, is self-reflective on what was going on with them or, you know, what they learned from it or took away from it, or, you know, just in a way that even if there's heartbreak or heartache, um, you could still be respectful of who you're talking about. And if they're not doing that, um, there's a high likelihood that they're not capable of love, especially if you don't see signs of that in their life, you know, connections with family, connections with friends and, and things like that. If you don't see any examples of love in their life and people are saying that they love you or they always want to be connected to you because of that, 
um, that's a surefire way to look at that. Lastly, what I'll mention is intelligence and memory. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, when you are confronting a narcissist about um, bad behavior or an injustice or something that they've done wrong to you or a violation of some kind, what tends to happen is they may forget or they don't recall things or they demand that you um, provide an example so that they can uh, they can offer an alternative excuse. People that are very narcissistic, unless there is some sort of diagnosed and documented severe cognitive impairment, um, you know, they're not dumb. So that means that they didn't have a sudden lapse in judgment. They didn't have a sudden lapse in memory. Um, it just means that, again, this sort of feigned forgetfulness or this feigned, like, I didn't know you felt that way, or I didn't know, you know, this and that. And I'm not talking about a person that was that may have unintentionally caused you harm and was genuine about that. I'm talking about people that continue to commit these infractions upon you or infractions in the relationships or their behavior is completely inappropriate. They know what they're doing. Um, they're not dumb. There's no um, reason that they should not be, um, you know, cognizant of their behavior and how that impacts you. And what's more is typically they will be very hypocritical or they will be contradictor contradict themselves and project later on. So the same thing that they weren't aware that they did to you, they will later on accuse you of doing it to them. Um, so there's, there's a good opportunity that that has happened already or will happen soon after um, there was an attempt to discuss an issue and where behavior was a violation of some sort, hurtful or inappropriate, um, that they will somehow manage to turn it around. But yeah, let's not uh, believe that a person doesn't know better. Um, and even if they don't know better, not knowing better is not an excuse to not do better. So hopefully that's been helpful to you. And that's what I got for today. Quick and dirty tips. Um, thanks so much for hanging out with me. Can't wait to have a chat again next week. I hope you guys are doing okay and staying safe. And until next time, take care of yourselves and be well. Bye-bye. Check out the sneak preview of next week's episode. Hmm. Yeah, it can get really complicated because when I work with clients, I break it down like this, right? So God created us for body, mind, spirit, soul, right? And so I think you know, and obviously being on this earth, God has given us all free will. We all have our own choice. And so mm -hmm. for me, the going through trauma, um, and a lot of my trauma was around a lot of CPTSD. So emotionally unavailable parents, abandonment, rejection, that kind of, uh, emotional mm -hmm. trauma. And that hits on, you know, three main things, low self-worth relationship issues and being emotionally dysregulated. Um, mm -hmm. so for me, I think I ha I've had a lot of moments of grieving. For example, I've gone through a lot with my mom recently. I, <laughs> I didn't realize, but I had a huge mother wound, um, mm -hmm. a lot of like maternal narcissism there and just that whole deep dive. And I've had a lot of moments with God, like, why did this happen? Like, this is so painful, but I don't think I ever questioned God's existence. Cause I always knew that like God has given us free will. So like with free will, people can choose to do bad things are born into a sinful world like there's and I know people have their own trauma and they pass that down so I don't think I ever question God's existence but I think I have I've been angry with God I will, I will say that I've had moments of being resentful